is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Good morning, Living Hope and Esperanza Viviente. Today is the first Sunday, and we've come to worship him again. We're going to give him our praise and our worship, our love and adoration. Good morning, Father. We praise your name today, for truly you are a great God great Father, great friend, and Savior, Lord. We come to bless your name. Be in your spoken word today and change the hearts of those who need you. Lift up those who are downtrodden and be the one for us today. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. Receive our offering of worship. We love you. Amen. Psalm 47, verse 7. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. Verse 4, 
May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. How great is our God. How great, how great is our God. One sixteen verses 1 and 2. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him 
as long as I live. love only you, Lord, because only you truly, truly love us. You're so merciful and kind. You provide. You care for. Lord, you forgive. 
You're an awesome father and friend. No one loves us the way you love us. No one cares for us the way you care for us. Certainly no one forgives us the way you forgive. Father, we thank you. We give you praise and glory today because truly you are awesome. You are awesome. Father, we want to learn to love you the way you love us. We want to be true disciples, servants of yours, that we might see your kingdom come, that we might take part with you in seeing your kingdom come. Help us, God, to do what it is you're calling us to do. Help us, Father, to open the eyes of the blind who cannot see you or who choose not to look. Help us, God, to have your words to say to them that they might hear and understand, receive, and be part of your kingdom. Help us, God. This is our calling. This is our mission to teach everyone what we've been taught by your word, by your word, not our words, but by your words, that they too might be in your kingdom. We love you, Father. We give you praise and glory today. Let none stand before you in our lives. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. I'm glad you're here with me this morning to worship the Lord as we open his word. Praise God for that singing. Amarte solo a ti. I follow only you, Lord. Oh, I trust that's the cry of our hearts to follow the Lord Jesus in spirit and in truth. This morning, we're going to look at a story that's a little bit outside of Galatians chapter 5. That's where we would normally be if we continued our series in Galatians. But I just feel like today is a great day to think about a certain man in Luke 19. We'll get there in a minute. The question for him really is, um, he's lost and he needs to be found and he knows it. What happens? How does Jesus deal with him? Maybe you feel like you're lost. Maybe the world around you is in chaos and you're having trouble today. And you know it. And you know that at the root of it, there's something very wrong with your relationship with God, if you have any at all. Maybe you don't. The Bible talks about lostness in terms of we've wandered away from God and we don't know how to get back. Well, today we're going to see how a man gets back. He comes back through the power of the Lord and the love of the Lord to be restored to the Lord. Praise God. And before we open the book this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we do bow before you and thank you for the morning. Thank you for the day. We're alive. You've given us life. We want to know about you. We want to worship you. We want to follow you. And I pray that you open our eyes to the truth today. And for that soul, Lord, that's watching today that doesn't know you, I pray that you open the eyes so that the one that's lost will be found today, so that the heart that's in darkness and struggling so mightily will find the peace and the comfort and the love that comes through knowing Jesus Christ and receiving your forgiveness. God, that is my prayer for all who watch. Build us up in our faith as we learn from your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, let's get right to it. If you know your Bible well, you probably know uh, a little bit about Luke 19 already. In Luke 19, 1, we read this. He entered Jericho. That's Jesus. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Let me say this first. Whenever you look at a story in the Bible, you have to pay really close attention to the details that you're given. Why? Because the author, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has been inspired to, to deliver certain details. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever read novels, but some novelists, they want to tell you uh, what the person's wearing in detail. They want to tell you what color the shoestrings are. They go through every little minute point as they describe their scene. Well, the Bible writer, when he writes Scripture through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's giving you details based on what the point of the story is. And that's very important for us to keep in mind. So as we look at this, we're going to look at the details we're given so that we understand more clearly what the point is. So Jesus enters Jericho, and he's passing through. Now, please remember at this point in Jesus' ministry, 
there are a ton of people following Jesus. Jesus is famous. I mean, who who wouldn't be famous if you could get that lame man up off his bed and he would walk? If that blind man could now see, uh, if you were hungry and you sat down on a hillside and he fed 5,000 men plus women and children with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. I mean, who wouldn't want to know about Jesus? He is totally revolutionizing the whole countryside. There's a there's a great fury of people, a, a flock that's following all over wherever he goes. All right, so now back to the story. He's coming into Jericho. I want you to vision Envision this huge crowd coming with him, okay? This mob following him. And now we're told what? And behold, there was a man. So that's the first detail we know about what's about to happen, that there was a guy. He was a male person, all right? His name was Zacchaeus. You know, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that don't mention somebody's name. Think about Moses' mother in Exodus 2, for instance. Her name is never mentioned. Well, we know that this man's name is Zacchaeus, but now we really get into the details that impact the story. He was a chief tax collector. All right, now, to think about that correctly, we have to think about what day and age Zacchaeus lived in. The Palestine area had been occupied by Roman soldiers. They were under the bondage of Rome, conquered, as it were. Okay, so what does a nation like Rome, or an empire, I should say, like Rome do after they conquer you? Well, they tax you. That's what they do. They try to take your money, as much of it as they can. Well, Zacchaeus is a guy who lives in this conquered area, and he has decided, I am not going to defend the locals. I am not going to stand up for the rights of the weak, uh, of my brothers and sisters here in the neighborhood, in this area, region. No, I'm going to align myself with Rome. I'm going to say to Rome, look, I'm going to, I'm going to collect taxes for you. And the way they usually did it was Rome would tell him, this is what you need to collect and give to us, but whatever you collect beyond that, you can keep for yourself. So the tax collector was somebody that was ruthless. You see them mentioned all through the Gospels. These are people that are hated by the locals. Why? Because they continue to oppress people. I'm not only going to collect money for the people that have occupied this land and give them your money, but I'm going to take more money than that from you so that I can be rich myself. So when we read in this story that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, you have to understand what that means. He's hated by the people. He's, he's despised as a traitor. Not only that, he's taking advantage of his people. In fact, that's the next de detail we're given. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So we see that Zacchaeus is making large money through the oppression of his people. All right, that's, that's the introduction we have to this man named Zacchaeus. And some people would even go as far as to say this, when it says he's the chief tax collector, it means not just that he is extorting his people for money, but that he is uh, the head of a whole group. It's kind of almost like a mafia type of group that's going to hurt you if you don't pay. In other words, he's at the top of the pyramid, the boss over all the tax collectors that are under him. As the chief ta tax collector, that's probably a good assumption to make, that that's his position. So he's making large money by oppressing the people. All right, how does the story go from there? I mean, you would think a guy like this, God would bring judgment, right? Watch this. The next verse, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Wow. Just think about that. We're not sure yet in the story whether his seeking is just curiosity or whether it's truly the case that he knows that he's not okay. You know, money doesn't satisfy. I know for those of you that have a lot of money, I don't personally have the burden, <laughs> but for those who have a lot of money, uh, you understand that all it is is a number. 
And maybe you get to live in a bigger house or take nicer vacations. Or I mean, there's certainly benefits to money. Uh, what is that saying? I've been rich and I've been poor and rich is better. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly true. In fact, knowing God is where true satisfaction comes. Uh, having a, a bank account with a bigger number than most people means nothing in terms of the satisfaction of the soul. Zacchaeus has probably come to a place in his life where he understands the emptiness of his existence. He's not necessarily driven anymore by trying to get more and more money, being richer and richer and richer. Maybe he's starting to understand the burden he's placing on people as he oppresses them. Maybe he's tired of being hated. And maybe his idea here in 19.3 to seek Jesus isn't about to let me just see another sideshow of somebody who says he can do miracles. I want to see a miracle. Let's see what you can do, Jesus. Maybe it's not like that at all. Instead, maybe it's more like, well, <laughs> I have no hope in my life. I'm lost. I have no capacity to have any fulfillment. I'm guilty. I'm full of shame. I understand that I'm hurting people to get rich off of them. Maybe his conscience has finally caught up to him and he wants to see Jesus for the reasons of being made whole again himself. I think you'll see that that's the case as the story progresses. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. That, that's the point. I, I want to know who Jesus is. But look at the trouble he has. But on account of the crowd, he could not. Why? Because he was small in stature. Zacchaeus is a short guy. All right. Fair enough. He still wants to see Jesus. And I, I just want to back up from this story for a second and just sort of look at what it takes to come to know Jesus. The first thing Zacchaeus does correctly is he seeks Jesus. So let's move forward in the story. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now catch the scene. Zacchaeus is this power broker, the head of the mafia, so to speak, the guy that has all the money and controls the people with an iron fist. He sinned greatly against his neighbors. <laughs> but he's willing, in Luke 19.4, to humble himself, to become a fool. He admits his shortness and his lack in terms of stature, and he decides... Look, I want to see Jesus more than I want to have the favor or be humiliated in front of the crowd. I don't care what they think of me. I need to see Jesus. And I think that's another really, really crucial step in our approach to God. First, we seek Jesus, as Zacchaeus is demonstrating for us. But then look what Zacchaeus does. He humbles himself. He climbs up this tree. He's not about to let his opportunity to see Jesus pass without having an encounter if he can. All right? It's amazing. Here we see this very rich guy. I mean, rich, guy, <laughs> rich guys don't climb trees to see people. All right? They have their servants have the people come over to the limo, and they roll down the window and have a few words. That's how rich guys roll, not Zacchaeus. He knows he's in trouble in his soul. He has to see Jesus regardless of what it costs him. He climbs the tree because Jesus is about to come this way and he can't even see him. So now you see the picture. Here's this mob surrounding Jesus coming down the road. And on the way down the road, Jesus, maybe out of the corner of his eye, he sees this guy climb up the tree. He sees this guy hanging out over the road as Jesus passes under him. Look what happens in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, so now Jesus is under the tree, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, wh what? Jesus hasn't met Zacchaeus before. Jesus calls him by name. I mean, let's just stop there and think about that for a second. Jesus understands not just that there's a guy in the tree, but there's a guy in the tree named Zacchaeus. Jesus isn't hateful towards Zacchaeus. Jesus isn't bringing judgment to Zacchaeus based on his past. Jesus knows Zacchaeus. He calls him by name. And now, watch this, 
hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, when the crowd hears this, I can guarantee you there's an audible gasp in the crowd because this crowd is made up of not only genuine seekers that want to know about Jesus, but it's also made up of religious rulers, the Pharisees, the people that are trying to trap Jesus, the people that really want to kill Jesus. They're accusing him of having his works done by Satan. They're, they're very hostile, very antagonistic. And now they see the Lord stop. They don't really question the fact that they, the Lord knows this guy's name. He calls him Zacchaeus. But when they hear, hey, I'm going to stay at your house today, oh, are you kidding me? You call yourself a rabbi, you call yourself a teacher, you, you claim to be some sort of son of God, and, and you're going to stay in the house of this hated tax collector. Everybody hates this guy. This guy is evil, and you're going to go to his house? In, in Jewish tradition, in custom, this was absolutely forbidden. You should stay as far away from sinful people as you can because you're supposed to be remaining pure. For Jesus to say, I want to be with this tax collector. I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus. You need to get down here. Our relationship together begins right now. Had to blow their minds. Why would the Lord spend time with such an evil person? Well, I'll tell you why. Zacchaeus is clearly seeking Jesus. Zacchaeus is clearly humbling, humbling himself to see Jesus. And Jesus is clearly seeking sinners. That's what we'll find out later in the passage. It'll say it directly. But Jesus is never, never going to reject anybody that wants to be with him and will humble themselves to know him. Never. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. The Lord will come to your house. The Lord will indwell you through his spirit. He is not rejecting sinful people ever. That's why he came, as we'll see later in the passage. The crowd, man, they're in shock. In fact, as, as we see the passage continue, what does Zacchaeus do? So he hurried and came down and received him joy, joyfully. Zacchaeus has just been recognized by Jesus Christ himself. And what does that mean? He's ecstatic. The Lord knows my name. The Lord wants to come to my house. Nobody in this crowd wants to come to my house. In fact, if they could do it, they'd probably kill me right now because they hate me so much. And here this one that is able to give sight to the blind and get the lame up off their feet backs and their mats to walk. The, the one that restores life knows me by name and wants to talk to me, wants to come over to my house. Wow. Zacchaeus is excited, beyond excited. And so what does he do? He obeys Jesus. Again, here's another key component for those that are seeking the Lord. First, Zacchaeus seeks Jesus. Then Zacchaeus humbles himself. He climbs up the tree. Then when he's called by the Lord, he obeys immediately. He's already under new management. He's ready to follow Jesus. I just want to point out to you a passage of Scripture in James 4 that gives us a similar principle. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Right? If you seek me, you'll find me. Uh, these, are, these are the words God gives us to help us understand that his heart is ready. His heart is ready to receive us. But we have to come. We have to come to him. We have to draw near to him. Zacchaeus is going through the steps to come to know God. He recognizes his own need, as we'll see in a minute. But it's crucially important for you to understand that his heart is seeking God. And it turns out, while he's seeking God, God is seeking him. But look, here's what I was talking about a minute ago. When they saw it, they all grumbled. They all grumbled. Are you kidding? The religious leadership just can't get a hold of the fact that Jesus is actually restoring people. And they could really care less about the fact that Jesus is restoring pe people, whether it's physical health that he's restoring or whether it's spiritual health as he 
brings people into his kingdom as they come to him by faith. In any case, he's healing body and soul, and the religious leadership can't handle it. When they saw it, they all grumbled. That's their response. They're not, they're not at all excited about what Jesus is doing. And watch this. He has gone in to be the guest of a man. Oh, here comes the label, who is a sinner. Oh, well, you can't hang out with sinners. Why? Well, because, you know, you're going to get polluted yourself. That's unclean. Don't do that. That's not how Jesus approaches life at all. He's not only going to go to hang out with a sinner, he knows this sinner's name. He not only knows this sinner's name, but he's going to go to his house and share a meal, and he's ready to receive this sinner into his eternal kingdom because the sinner does what? The sinner seeks him. The sinner humbles himself. The sinner obeys him. That all points to the fact that the sinner believes who the Jesus is who he says he is. It's such a wonderful thing to think about. The opposition, forget about those guys. They want to stop God's plan. But God doesn't allow that to happen. Zacchaeus comes to Jesus, regardless of the opinions of the people that are watching this play out. And as the passage moves forward, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, now watch this. We're not sure whether they're still on the road or they're at at his house at this point. But Zacchaeus has been touched by the fact that the Lord knows his name, that he's recognizing that Jesus is who he says he is. He feels the love that Jesus is demonstrating to him by being willing to be associated with him regardless of the opinion of others, right? Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. What's happening here? A rich guy is about to give half of his stuff away? If he's defrauded somebody, which he's defrauded numerous people probably over years of time, He's going to repay them fourfold. I mean, can you imagine getting the knock on the door? Excuse me, I'm the tax collector. I'm the one you've hated for so long. Um, I realize I stole X amount from you. I defrauded you. I, I took it above and beyond what the Ro- Romans wanted me to take from you. And, and I cheated you. And I'm going to restore you fourfold. Here's some money for you. I mean, talk about a shocking claim. Here, here Zacchaeus is doing something so incredibly important in his walking with Jesus now that he's come to know Jesus. What's he doing? Well, he's repenting. You know, the Bible says that we need to turn away from our sin. One of the first sermons in the New Testament as Peter delivers his sin, his sermon for the first time, what does he say regarding sin? And Peter said to them, repent. What does that mean? Turn away from your evil. Restore what you've taken. Refuse to be evil anymore. Live by the truth. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will be brought into God's family if you'll turn away from your evil and believe. If you'll walk with Jesus and obey him, Jesus restores. Well, we see Zacchaeus doing this very thing. And just another one for your education, again in 319 in Acts. Repent, therefore, and turn back. That's it. Turn away from your sin, that your sins may be blotted out. God's forgiveness comes through repentance. You and I have to not only understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, we, we not only have to believe in him and surrender our lives to him, but then we have to deal with a new life that he's given us by having a new lifestyle. We have to end up in a place where we're not willing to be evil anymore. We're, we might still sin occasionally and fall, but we repent. We get back up. God, forgive me. Change my heart. Allow me to serve you as you've called me to serve you. Zacchaeus is demonstrating 
one of the key points necessary to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, let's go back and look at it again. What's he doing? Well, he's saying, look, I'm going to give half my goods away. I, I no longer have money as my highest priority. I no longer think of myself as wanting money more than anything else. That's a real change of heart. And guess what? That's exactly how Jesus impacts us as we come to him by faith. He changes our hearts. When we come to really know him, our priorities are completely different. Why? Because we want to be with him. We want to obey him. We want to do what honors him with our lives. So here we see Zacchaeus. I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'm going to restore it fourfold. This is absolute repentance. Praise God for the example we're given here in Luke 19 about what happens when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. So let's think about it again. Zacchaeus, he seeks Jesus. What else does he do? He humbles himself. He climbs the tree just to find Jesus. Then when Jesus tells him to come down, what does he do? He obeys Jesus. And here we see in verse 8, he repents. He becomes somebody that says, I would rather face the humiliation of saying I'm wrong before the entire world. I, I would divest myself of my wealth. I would repent and say I'm sorry to all the people I've ripped off. I'm going to give back four times what I've taken from them. Zacchaeus is going, unknowingly, he's going down the theological list of what it takes to come into relationship with the living Christ. Jesus has come to him. Jesus now knows him. Zacchaeus is now in the kingdom of God. Those other guys, they're outside grumbling. You know, what are you doing, Jesus, hanging out with a sinner? But Jesus looks at that sinner and says, you know what? This is a person that wants to be forgiven. This is a person that wants to do right. They're lost. Let me find them. Zacchaeus was lost. Jesus finds him. I mean, maybe you find in your own heart today you feel lost, like you're just wandering around life and not really understanding why things are the way they are and having no moral compass in your life. You're, you're hurting other people as you sin against them. You're hurting yourself as you sin against God. Maybe today's the day for you to think about this in terms of your own life. Are you willing to seek Jesus? Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to obey the Lord? Will you repent and come into relationship with Jesus Christ? These are great questions for us. Because look what Jesus says now. When he thinks about what Zacchaeus has just said, when he understands what's just happened, and Jesus said to him, Today, what's happened? Salvation has come to this house. Jesus is bringing Zacchaeus into his kingdom because Zacchaeus believes Zacchaeus is willing to repent. Zacchaeus is humbling himself. Salvation has come to this house. Now, here comes another audible gasp in the crowd, since he also is a son of Abraham. I want you to understand this. Jesus is using this term to say, I have allowed Zacchaeus into my kingdom. All these self-righteous guys listening to this, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, the leadership of the Judaic system of that day, they're going to have a heart attack over this. What do you mean? He's not a son of Abraham. We're holy. We're the ones that are sons of Abraham. Jesus is crossing the line here to say, you know what? I can bring anybody into my kingdom that, that will come. doesn't matter what your past is. doesn't matter how many people you've hurt. It doesn't matter how many people hate you. I don't hate you. If you'll come to me by faith, I'll love you. I'll bring you into my kingdom. If you read further in the book of Galatians, for instance, we're told many times that we become sons of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ, that we are brought into that place where we're adopted into God's family because we have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus is now in the family of God. Despite the whole world looking at him as a sinner, Jesus looks at him now as a saint. Jesus has transformed his heart. 
Jesus has brought him into right relationship. Why? Because Zacchaeus did what's required. In fact, watch how this ends. It's so profound. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man, that's Jesus. And just a little pause here for you in case you haven't um, thought about this in a while. If you go to Daniel 7.13, I believe it is, um, you'll see that there's a figure that Daniel mentions in the Old Testament called the Son of Man, who is from the Ancient of Days. He is God. And as we see in the Gospels, Jesus has adopted that phrase, Son of Man, to align himself with that title to make sure people that really understand their Old Testament understand that he is telling them he is God. Okay? It, most people look at the Son of Man as a phrase that means he was born of Mary. Well, in, in one sense, he certainly is human. He was born of Mary, but the Son of Man title has so much more behind it. You can read Daniel 7 for yourself and see what I mean, but he is telling them, I'm God, for the Son of Man came what? Here's why Jesus came, to seek and to save the lost. That's what the death on the cross will be all about as Jesus finishes his ministry in a few chapters here from Luke 19 and dies on a cross. Jesus takes the punishment for Zacchaeus' sin upon himself as he experiences the wrath of God against sin on behalf of Zacchaeus as he dies on the cross. That's why Jesus can offer Zacchaeus salvation because he knows that the sin that Zacchaeus has been committed, he himself will pay for on the cross. This is what you and I hope in as well, that because Jesus died on a cross, our sin has been punished through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Therefore, we don't owe that debt to God anymore to pay for our own sin. It's been paid for. Our debt has been canceled. What happens now? The righteousness of Jesus Christ is placed on us. What happens for Zacchaeus? His heart is compelled to repent. His heart is compelled to receive the Lord and feel the joy of being forgiven, to feel the joy of new life, to know that his eternity is in the hands of God as he walks with Jesus. The Son of Man came to seek and to save. Now notice, this is so ironic. The passage began with, Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus, but the passage ends with Jesus is seeking Zacchaeus. Did I say that wrong? Zacchaeus seeks Jesus in the beginning. Now, Jesus seeks Zacchaeus in the end. Praise God. You think you're looking for God? I can tell you this. God's looking for you too. You think you want to know God? I can tell you honestly, all you have to do is sincerely bow before the living Lord Jesus Christ Ask him into your life. Tell him you believe. Tell him that you know he rose from the dead. Ask him to forgive you and walk with him. Obey his word. He will revolutionize your heart and mind and life. The Bible calls it being born again. So before we go today, I just want you to think about this again. What does it take if you're lost? Seek Jesus. That's exactly what Zacchaeus does. Humble yourself. Pay any price in terms of the opinions of people, in terms of how you have to climb the tree in your life to find him. There's no price that's, that's too high in order to find truth and find life. That's what Zacchaeus is after. That's exactly what he found. He obeys Jesus. This is the call upon all of our lives to obey Jesus. And then he repents. I'm going to give my wealth, half my wealth back, if I defrauded somebody, I'm going to pay them four times. This is where the Bible takes us. If we're lost, we're not going to be cast out and judged and hit with God's baseball bat if we will come to Jesus on his terms. So, are you lost? If the answer to that is yes, learn from Zacchaeus. Repent. Come to Jesus Christ by faith and you will be saved. Church, I pray God blesses you today. Serve him well.